What's going on, my pre-healthcare brothers and sisters? I hope that y'all are having a wonderful day. We're continuing on in our ATIT's Like a Boss question review series, the reading portion, and today we're gonna to be talking about identifying details. So question one, Christopher Columbus was particularly influenced by the maps of the ancient geographer Ptolemy. Ptolemy argued that the world was round, which went against the belief of the day that the world was flat. Columbus sided with Ptolemy on this question and set out to prove that it was so. At the time, it was widely held that sailing west from Europe would lead to certain death. Believing that the world was round, Columbus thought that one who sailed west would wind up in the east. Other scientists of the day rejected this idea, so Columbus wrote to a respected Italian scholar, Paolo Toscanelli to ask for his opinion on the matter. Toscanelli supported the idea of Columbus's trip and sent work to Columbus in 1474. After receiving Toscanelli's encouragement, Columbus focused all of his thoughts and plans on traveling westward. To make the journey, he would require the help of a generous financial backer, so he went to seek the aid of the King of Portugal. Columbus asked the King for ships and sailors to make the journey. In return, he promised to bring back wealth and to help to convert natives living in the lands to the church. Portugal refused, and Columbus approached Italy unsuccessfully as well. He went to Spain next. Queen Isabella of Spain agreed to support the journey. It took time for Columbus to convince her, but he did succeed, and she paid for the trip. Part of what led the queen to believe in Columbus was the way that he focused on his goal for such a long time with great intent. He spent the best years of his life working toward his dream, remaining persistent and determined. Legend has it that even during his first voyage, members of his crew became frightened and uncertain, wanting to return home, but Columbus pressed on. The eventual discovery of the Americas was the reward for his commitment. More than 500 years later, the geography of the world is often taken for granted, but Columbus was an early visionary whose results proved at least some of his theories were correct. Which country was responsible for funding Columbus's voyage to the Americas? Was it A, Italy, B, Spain, C, Turkey, or D, Portugal? And the correct answer is B, Spain. Choice A is incorrect because while Italy was the first country mentioned in the passage and an Italian man named Toscanelli supported Columbus's travel ideas, the passage never mentions Italy's financial support of Columbus. Choice D is incorrect because the passage specifically says that Portugal refused to financially support Columbus. Let's move on to question two. The English town of Stratford-upon-Avon is visited yearly by tourists wanting to view the birthplace of William Shakespeare. William's father, John Shakespeare, bought the family home on Henley Street, and it is here that William is believed to have been born in 1564. Shakespeare's birth home remained in his family until the early 1800s, and it is now a public museum. Shakespeare attended school at the King Edward Grammar School, which occupied the first floor of a building known as the Guildhall. It was a guild hall that Shakespeare first experienced theater when he saw a theatrical performance given by a group of traveling actors. The Royal Shakespeare Company still performs in the town at the Royal Shakespeare and Swan Theaters. Close to the guild hall is the site of a house known as New Place, which was bought by Shakespeare himself. Here, Shakespeare lived during the later part of his life until his death in 1660. Although he spent most of his career in London with trips back to Stratford, he moved permanently to New Place in the last years of his life and is believed to have written some of his later works there. Only the foundations of the New Place house now remains. In the town of Shottery, one mile from Sh Stratford, is the cottage where Shakespeare's wife, Anne Hathaway, was born. The Hathaway Cottage, now also a museum, is actually a large thatch-roofed Farmhouse with sprawling gardens where Shakespeare is believed to have developed his relationship with Anne. They married in 1582 and had three children. How was William Shakespeare first introduced to plays? Was it A, when he was a boy, the Royal Shakespeare Company visited his classroom? B, he read many transcripts in the Guildhall where he attended school as a child? 
C, he watched a traveling group of performers in the same building as King Edward Grammar School. D, his wife, Anne Hathaway, began taking him to New Place, where he performed as an actress. And the correct answer is C. He watched a traveling group of performers in the same building as King Edward Grammar School. Choice A is incorrect because the Royal Shakespeare Company was not yet established when William was a boy. Choice B offers information that they never stated in the passage, while Choice D takes two elements of the passage, Anne Hathaway and New Place, and incorrectly link them together. Choice C is thus the correct answer. Question three. One of the important gymnastic exercises in the original Montessori school approach is that of the line. For an exercise, a line is drawn in chalk or paint on the floor. Instead of one line, there may also be two lines drawn. The children will are taught to walk on these lines like tightrope walkers, placing their feet one in front of the other. To keep their balance, the children must make efforts similar to those of a real tightrope walker, except that they have no danger of falling, since the lines are only drawn on the floor. The teacher herself performs the exercise first, showing clearly how she places her feet, and the children imitate her without her even needing to speak. At first, it is only certain children who will follow her, and when she has shown them how to walk the line, she leaves, letting the exercise develop on its own. The children, for the most part, continue to walk, following with great care the movement they have seen and making efforts to keep their balance so that they don't fall. Gradually, the other children come closer and watch and try the exercise. In a short time, the entire line is covered in the children balancing themselves and continuing to walk around, watching their feet attentively. Music may be used at this point. It should be a very simple march without an obvious rhythm. It should simply accompany and support the efforts of the children. When children learn to master their balance in this way, Dr. Montessori believed they can bring the act of walking to a remarkable standard of perfection. Before the children begin to walk the line, what must they do? A, master their balance. B, watch their teacher. C, watch their feet attentively. Or D, draw a line on the floor. And the correct answer is B, watch their teacher. The children learn to master their balance by taking part in the activity which requires practice. Therefore, choice A is not a logical choice. Choice C occurs after the children have started walking the line, not before. And choice D refers to an action the teacher must make, not the children. So choice B is the only correct answer. Moving on to our next question. Australian-born Sigmund Freud, a psychoanalytic psychologist, lived in the mid-19th and the mid-20th century. The psychoanalytic approach refers to the school of thought that unconscious memories or desires guide our emotions and actions. In personality theory, this equates to events from childhood shaping and individual self without a person's conscious awareness. These specific childhood events continue to exert a strong influence over our lives and dominate our emotions. If you are a life of the party, extroverted personality, perhaps you have a healthy upbringing. However, quiet, deep thinker types can be just as functional. How your caregivers responded to your natural urges will determine your level of mental health according to the psychoanalytic approach. Freud believed that as a child, an individual's actions are driven by hidden impulses and that repression of denial of those impulses by parents or society can lead to fixations or personality disorders. Alternatively, of the child's impulses are accepted as normative um, to his or her development, then a functional adult behavioral pattern should take root. Now, by no means should parents allow every impulse to dictate behavior. Each of us have a sensor, which Freud referred to as the super ego. This element of the psyche is largely helpful and acts as a conscience. However, if we let the super ego dominate our personality, Freud believed it could lead to repression and inauthentic behavior. Freud often worked with highly distressed female clients repressed by their natural modes of expression. This is how we develop, how I should say he developed many of his theories, 
which some people believe are not very scientific. By today's standards, they are not, but Freud's ideas of the unconscious urges drive our, driving our behavior was revolutionary for his time. Which of the following is a belief held by Sigmund Freud according to the passage? Is it A, no scientific support exists in the idea that unconscious urges drive our behavior? B, the superego serves as a sensor that primarily causes repression? C, parents should allow every impulse that a child has to dictate the child's behavior? Or is it D, functional adult behavior should result from accepting a child's impulses as normal? And the correct answer is D. Functional adult behavior should result from accepting a child's impulse as normal. Choice D is the only offered statement that Freud himself believed. Choice B misrepresents information about the passage. Choice C is the opposite of what Freud's beliefs were according to paragraph 2. The current tests for measuring IQ or an individual's intelligence quotients were developed during the early and mid 12th century. Their use was popularized by Terman, who designed specific tests for the use of the U.S. Army. Some psychologists today assert that the traditional system of measuring IQ should remain the sole method of assessing intelligence. Historically, the test has been constructed based on the assumption that there exists one general intelligence factor that impacts an individual's intellectual capacity. The validity of this assumption has been challenged by other psychologists. In particular, Howard Gardner was emphasized that of a unified conception of intelligence based on a single factors remain highly limited and unnecessarily constraining. Gardner was postulated as alternative theory concerning the existence of multiple intelligences. He posits that individuals can possess intelligence in particular areas such as linguistics intelligence, spiritual intelligence, spatial intelligence, interpersonal intelligence, intrapersonal intelligence, musical intelligence, mathematical intelligence, and kinesthetic intelligence, among others. Gardner asserts that individuals can be extremely intelligent and exhibit talent in one area, while failing to demonstrate, I should say failing to demonstrate, the same level of prowess in another area. His theory has been discussed widely, although efforts to obtain empirical evidence to support his ideas is still in process. Which of the following statements is true based on the passage? Is it A, individuals are extremely intelligent, typically and demonstrate equally high levels of skills in all areas? B, the work of Howard Gardner emphasizes a unified conception of intelligence based on a single factor? C, the use of IQ tests were made popular by Terman, who designed specific tests for the U.S. Army? Or D, the traditional system of measuring IQ has remained the sole method of assessing intelligence? And the correct answer is C. The use of IQ tests were made popular by Terman, who designed specific tests for use in the U.S. Army. The statement choice C is mentioned in the first paragraph of the passage and is therefore correct. Saltwater fish and freshwater fish are related, but their natural environments prove rather distinctive. In terms of being kept as pets, freshwater fish require less maintenance. They live in water that can be adapted from tap water, and they can be kept in many different types of containers in addition to aquariums. Saltwater fish, on the other hand, require a specific type of salt-infused water. Careful watch of the pH balance of water must also be maintained. According to this passage, what must people watch carefully when they have saltwater fish? Is it A, the type of food the fish ingests, B, the water temperature, C, the pH balance of the water, or D, the type of light in the aquarium? And the correct answer is C, the pH balance of the water. The passage explains that saltwater aquariums require a fish owner to check the pH balance of the water carefully. Choice B is incorrect because the passage specifically describes the pH balance. Music can have a significant positive influence on individuals in many different circumstances. Persons who must spend time recuperating in the hospital are frequently soothed by the presence of soft music. Babies are trained to respond to auditory noises through the use of music. Persons going through emotional difficulties such as grief frequently listen and create music as a means of dealing with issues they are experiencing. 
Even people who simply need a short respite from the stresses of the day often use music as a calming and coping mechanism. According to the passage, what can happen when a baby is exposed to music on a regular basis? Is it A, the baby can associate various sounds with different foods, B, the baby can learn to distinguish between his or her parents' voices, C, the baby can learn to respond to different noises, or D, the baby can learn to discriminate between the voices of siblings. And the correct answer is C, the baby can learn to respond to different noises. The passage suggests that babies who are exposed to music on a regular basis can learn to respond to noises. Choice A is incorrect because the passage explicitly mentions how music can foster auditory training in infants. And moving on to our last question, question 10. Bees are a natural part of the pollination cycle of plants. Many plants require the assistance of bees in order to transfer their pollen so that flowers can be produced. Bees travel from flower to flower in minuscule grains of pollen attached to the bee's legs. The pollen travels much more efficiently via bees than it might if it had to rely on the wind, for example. In this manner, bees assist in the natural pollination cycle through the action of gathering nectar from plants and flowers. Bees are a critical component of this process. Without them, plants would face much greater challenges in their reproduction. The passage mentions through the action of gathering nectar from flowers in order to do which of the following? A, to provide a critique of the manner in which bees go about creating honey. B, to illustrate the fact that a great deal of pollen gets mixed into the nectar that bees gather. C, to suggest the nectar is the main ingredient involved in the bee's creation of honey or D, to explain the primary action through which bees contribute to the pollination process. The passage indicates which of the following about the migration of pollen via bees as opposed to the migration by the wind. Is it A, pollen travels much more efficiently via bees than it would by the wind. B, pollen can travel equally as effectively via bees or by the wind. C, Pollen is too heavy to be transported by the wind except during wind storms. Or D, bees are sometimes allergic to pollen, so it must be transported by the wind. And the correct answer is A, the pollen travels much more efficiently via bees than it would by the wind. The passage explains that pollen travels much more efficiently by bees' legs than it would being blown by the wind. Choice C is incorrect because the passage never mentions the weight of the pollen. I hope that this video was helpful in passing your ATITs like a boss. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me and comment down below. I always answer your questions and I love hearing your feedback. Please follow me on my social media. I am on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And of course, here on YouTube, make sure that you subscribe. But until next time, I will see you all in the next video. Bye.